At some point in your math education, you probably learned about fractions, and that sometimes two fractions can be equal to each other. Maybe you're learning about this right now. When you were taught how to find equivalent fractions, maybe you were told something along the lines of what you do to the top, you do to the bottom. I'm willing to bet that a significant handful of you out there tried something like this and were then immediately told, oh, no, you can't do that. You can only do multiplication and division. But is that true? Is there really anything stopping you from, say, adding one to both the top and bottom? I'm sure a lot of us have experienced something like this, maybe not necessarily with fractions, but at some point in our math career where we tried some mathematical maneuver to solve a problem and were told by a teacher, a parent, or some other educational figure, you can't do that. I think a lot of us learn math like this as a set of strict rules and formulas that we have to adhere to and that we can't ever stray from. We end up memorizing and performing all these algorithms until our perception of math becomes one of cold and hard fact. It becomes a subject devoid of creativity and imagination, something we often more readily associate with subjects like writing or art. In Paul Lockhart's A Mathematician's Lament, he posits this really beautiful metaphor for this state of math education as a lot of us have known it. I'll try my best to summarize it here in my own sort of way, and then we'll get back to the fractions, I promise. Imagine a world where painting and or music were considered as core to a student's education as language or science were. These subjects are required, and those at the top decide to rigorously standardize painting and music education as thoroughly as any of the other core subjects. Imagine that students are made to practice drawing music scales, memorize their circle of fifths, and be able to recognize a pitch just from sound alone. Or imagine a world where students are mandated to memorize their color wheels, be able to recite the definitions of different types of art styles, and they practice by tracing famous works of art. In this world we are imagining, however, Students are not allowed to actually make their own pieces of art. They are simply tested on whether they can reproduce songs note for note or follow paint by number pieces. Can they transpose a musical phrase into a different key? Can they correctly mix a certain color using just red, blue, and yellow? In this world, messing around with art creatively is considered advanced and not something useful for passing tests for school. Imagine wanting to learn how to play the piano and being told by your teacher that you wouldn't actually get to touch the instrument until you learned all your scales. That's nuts, we, we would never teach art this way. And yet it's, it's often how we teach math, even though math allows for so much creativity. Imagine what math education might look like if we just allowed kids to play with it, the way they might play around with a keyboard or a crayon. Oh, but math is a rigid sort of discipline, you might say. No matter what you do, one plus one will always equal two. Well, we're told blue plus red always equals purple, and there's still so much creative stuff you can do with that. So whenever I hear a student say, you can't do that in math, it makes me wanna say, well, actually, you probably can. Why don't we see what happens and explore why doing it isn't necessarily useful to the problem you're actually trying to solve. Let's get back to our original thought. What happens when we add the same number to the top and bottom of a fraction? Let's play in this space a bit. Let's, let's start by defining the ideas we're playing with. What's a fraction? Well, to define a fraction, we need to define what one means. Okay, so it's the first number in the set of natural numbers. Eh, but mm, what does that even mean? One could mean very different things if we're talking about, say, one cow 
or one building? Do I mean one of these or one of these? One of these or one of these? What does it mean to have one of something? Okay, so let's define one as something whole, unbroken, and singular unto itself. A fraction, then, is what we get when we take one whole thing, break it into equally sized pieces, and keep some number of those pieces. No matter how large or small our designated whole thing is, the relationship between the pieces is constant and equal. In fact, math is very often about the idea of relationships. Not so much about memorizing facts, but about exploring the way quantities can relate to each other. We can define the parts of a written fraction as the denominator, the number of pieces we broke our one thing into, and the numerator, the number of those pieces that we're actually interested in. Okay, so let's start messing with the numerator and the denominator. We'll start with one half and just go with adding plus one to the top and bottom for now, because I often find that the best place to start when playing around with math is to just start with the simplest case you can imagine. If we do this, our new fraction is two thirds. Just from visual confirmation alone, we can immediately see that these two quantities are not equivalent. They aren't equal. And, and well, that, that answers that question, I guess, but only partially. Because now we know that adding the same number to the top and bottom doesn't always preserve the value of the fraction, but we don't know why. You might think we're doing the same thing to both parts, so shouldn't the result be an equivalent fraction? Let's examine that line of thinking by examining these two actions, increasing the numerator and increasing the denominator, separately. Let's use the fraction two-fifths this time. If we increase the numerator, we can see that the amount of the pieces we're interested in also increases. And this makes sense. The more pieces we have, the more our fraction is worth. Okay, let's deal only with the denominator now. When we add one, what this really does is add to the total number of pieces available. When we do this, each piece has to make room for a new piece. And so each individual piece needs to be smaller for all of them to fit in the same space. And so the more and more total pieces there are, the less significant these two pieces we're interested in become. So effectively, adding to our numerator increases the worth of the fraction, and adding to the denominator decreases the worth of the fraction. Doing both actions at once has the effect of doing a little bit of both, but we can see just from looking at the difference between one half and two thirds that the net result is an overall increase. In fact, if we were to keep doing this, just adding one to both the top and bottom, we see that the fraction gets closer and closer to being complete. In this particular case, there's always one missing piece from our total, and that missing piece gets smaller and smaller and smaller. We never truly close the gap and complete the fraction, but we can get pretty close, depending on how long we want to do this. Compare this to multiplying the top and bottom by some consistent number. We'll look at one third this time and multiply both the numerator and denominator by four. Multiplying the denominator by four quadruples the total number of pieces and multiplying the numerator by four also quadruples the number of pieces we're interested in. So multiplying some number by the numerator increases the value of the fraction and multiplying that number by the denominator decreases the value of the fraction. However, this time doing both these actions together balances out perfectly. If each individual piece is four times as small, then you need four times as many of them to create the same value the original piece had. And listen, that was a lot of words to say that if you want an equivalent fraction, just multiply the top and bottom by some number. But if I just told you that from the get-go, well, where would the fun be in that? And also, I think there's something to be said for placing more importance in the act of 
asking a question than in simply just getting an answer for the answer's sake. When you approach math in such a way that prioritizes the answer first, it's sort of like trying to run a race, but wanting to start at the finish line. There's no real growth that happens when you do that. And also, it's just really boring. <laughs> I mean, we didn't even get to explore if our reasoning still holds up when we subtract the same number from the top and bottom, or if we divide by the same number. I mean, hopefully diving deep into the specifics of, of what's really going on with the numbers just inspires more questions for you to explore. Is there a case where adding the same number to the top and bottom does result in an equivalent fraction? We've already proven that it doesn't work in the cases we explored here, but that's not the same as proving that it never works. Or what happens when we increase the numerator beyond the amount of available pieces? Can we take a fraction of a fraction, and what would that look like? Anyway, I hope there was something in this video that sparked at least a little bit of curiosity in you. Um, I've, I've been wanting to make something like this for a while now because I work with a lot of students from a variety of grades, specifically for math, and there are a lot of recurring, um, well, I, I don't want to call them mistakes, but rather there are a lot of common mis misunderstandings that I see where students try something in their math and don't understand why it doesn't have the effect that they expect it to have. And I, I always find myself wanting to deep dive into those misunderstandings, even though usually the student is really just more interested in getting their homework done. I, I do already have a list of things I want to explore, but it'd be cool to add to that list and hear, you know, what other people are interested in. Um, and, I, and I guess I have to find some way to end this video, so I, I guess I'll close out with my favorite quote from Paul Lockhart's A Mathematician's Lament. Um, and, I, and I really do recommend reading the whole thing if you have time. Somehow, I was able to create a profound, simple beauty out of nothing and change myself in the process. Isn't that what art is all about? Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.